Yeah, I'm getting older, that's a fact. Amen. Well, hey, gang, good to see you tonight. It's a great privilege to be here again, amen. Come by to thank you for your faithful support. You folks have been praying for us and sending us diesel money for I don't know how long, amen. We thank God for every prayer. That's a great fact. We've had a great, great year already. This ain't but April. We've had a great year already. First time in 30 years we had revival meetings in January. And the whole month of January we just filled up and had a great time. And uh, God blessed and, and took care of some things. A meeting in Louisiana, I'll tell you this quick. A meeting in Louisiana, just, I say a couple of days ago, it's already been a month or better. Uh, I preached on salvation uh, on a Sunday morning in a church to a bunch of people that uh, have been <clears throat> saved forever. And uh, I preached on, have you been saved with this verse? And I dealt with, for by grace are you saved through prayer. And uh, I went, it's like some of you just did. And I said, well, the verse itself says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And if you think your prayer saved you, you, know, you better pray. But if you think your prayer saved you, that's why you haven't changed. And that's why you're not different. That's why you're not ready to meet God. And, and on and on and on. And, and back over there on that side over there, uh, a lady, uh, her husband and, and children were sitting there. And, and she took to crying. I mean, five minutes into the message, she's bawling her eyes out. And she's sobbing. She's crying so hard back in that corner. And a couple over here just got married about three weeks before that. Now, all these folks have been in church for a long time. Uh, but the Holy Ghost came by that day and showed them the truth. Now, I'm not a doubt spreader. Everybody claims I am and all that. I just want you to make sure you're saved. You, you, we're, in, we're not long for we're, we're going to be leaving here. And you best sure enough be saved. Amen. You don't want to go through what's coming. It's worse than what's going on now. I want you to realize that, okay? Uh, and so you must make sure that you're right. Make sure that you're saved by the grace of God. But there's a lot of false salvation in our churches across America. A lot of it. And uh, it doesn't line up with the Bible. And it's a, it's a struggle. It's a struggle because some of these are such traditional salvations that grandma was this way, and my mama's this way, and I'm this way, and that's how it's going to be, preacher. And no matter what you preach, I ain't changing. Well, that might be well and good down here, you know, when the pride is yapping, but it ain't going to be worth a hang at the rapture of the church. And so I just need you to pray, if you will, as I endeavor after all these many years. Mama and I have been at this thing now 46 years altogether. 38 years on the road, wearing out trucks and campers. And uh, I've done got our two-year-old camper already refixed from the ground up. Amen. Uh, I just all kinds of stuff had to fix on it. You say, Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying I'm trying to wear that stuff out for God. And I'm trying to just keep right on going and keep right on getting it done. We're too close to the rapture of the church to stop now and quit. So are you. Uh, you, you find families with all these little people in your, in your house. But what a great blessing to have all these little people around. Uh, God help you if you quit now and lead your babies out of church. All across America, there are children that can't come to church because they don't drive. You got that? Did you hear what I said? They don't drive. And mom and dad got a burn of their saddle. And so because she got a burr in her saddle, or he got a burr under his saddle, they won't bring their children to church. Now, they had a chance to be saved, and they had a chance to hear the truth, but they won't give their children a chance to hear the truth. I say there's a special judgment for that bunch. I really do. And so I just want you to realize something. We can't stop now. We can't quit now. And even if your kids are like ours, our kids are grown and gone, our grands are grown and gone, we got five greats on the ground. What would the funeral be like when I go 
and whoever's preaching my funeral says, Brother Hartman did pretty good for 40 years, but then he quit. All these years of choosing God over our families. Why don't you come by? Why don't you stay here? Why don't you? Listen, my own grandson said just, just about a year ago, he said, Papa, he said, what you need to do is quit that ministry stuff and stay home and take care of your parents. Now, that's a great idea. And if my God tells me to do that, that's exactly what I would do. But if you love your father or mother more than me, don't think ill of me because I don't sit there and watch my parents day in and day out. I'm doing what I believe will get them help. I'm trying to stay faithful to my God, and I'm praying and seeking God's will for their lives day in and day out. God's the only one I know can help them. Me sitting there looking at them all day long, 24-7, ain't going to help them. Come on now. Now, they're not in a, in a tree stump somewhere starving to death, okay? They're being taken care of. What I'm trying to get you to understand is this. We're headed to the judgment seat of Christ. I'm saying all that to say this. We're headed to the judgment seat of Christ. Ain't that right? So if you loved ones will will stand up and let me read out of you 1 Peter chapter 4. Just for a little bit. Just for a little bit tonight. Then Mom and I is going to drive back over to Williamsburg, get in the camper. We're headed to Fisherville tomorrow. Be at the home church a couple of weeks. And then the 1st of May we start meetings. And we're in meetings all the way to November 3rd. So you pray for us, and thank you for your prayers, and thank you for your support, and thank you for the privilege to be here today. Listen to the Word of God today. Listen to the Word of God. 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, is that you? You saved tonight? Come on, church. Come on, come on. Are you saved tonight? Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. And here it comes. You look ready? The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now Peter wrote this 2,000 years ago. This is a long-aged text. Peter said it's time for judgment must begin at the house of God. If it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? You and I are on the very edge of a trump sound and a shout coming. I mean, it, it, any second now, it's going to come. And you and I are going to go home and face Jesus Christ, our Savior. And salvation brought you to that judgment. Now, we're going to be at the white throne judgment too, but we're going to be behind Christ there, not in front of him, thank God. Our sin judgment's already taken care of at Calvary. Christ took care of that for us. But our living judgment, our service judgment, we will face. Church, I want you to understand something before I pray and let you sit down. Salvation is wonderful. Right? Come on. But it ain't enough at the judgment seat of Christ. It just ain't going to be enough. You're going to give an account. I'm going to give an account. We're going to judgment, church. Peter said it ought to begin at the house of God. So if we would start tonight on this judgment seat of Christ deal, I wonder what our judgment will be like when we get to the 
judgment seat of Christ deal. What do you think? You like to learn about that a little bit? <laughs> Father in heaven, please. I need you, Lord Jesus, to just open our hearts and our minds to the truth of this thing. God, I, I'm amazed at the miracle. Lord, we got up this morning. You hadn't come get us yet. We've gone through the day, my Lord, and you haven't come got us yet. Lord, this world is doing exactly what it is you said it would do just before the rapture of the church. And yet, Lord, your long suffering and your patience is still flowing in this world. Christ rejecting man is still up and going and doing, God, because of your mercy. Lord in heaven, I'm asking you to get us, the children of God, ready for our time when we meet you and give an account of our lives to you, God. Let me thank you for the salvation you brought to us at Calvary. Let me thank you, Lord, for the pardon that you brought to us at the resurrected Christ. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you tonight that we're your people. And what we need to do, Lord, is make up our mind to come home gaining rewards and not losing. That we, Heavenly Father, might honor you while we walk this earth. Through the briars, through the storm we just sang about God. Through, the, through that song we just sang about the storm. God in heaven, the storms of life are raging. But our hope is bright. Our future is wonderful. We're heaven bound, God. And we're looking forward to that moment. Just after the judgment. So would you help us tonight, I pray. Bless my preacher in Virginia, Lord, up in Fisherville. My preacher brethren everywhere that's bringing message. May souls be saved and as saints be helped everywhere. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen, my Father. Amen. You may be seated, dear family. You may be seated. Now, we all know, dear family, that we're all going to face this judgment. According to the old book, judgment is a decision against crime. Now, if you really take a good look at us, uh, we're kind of criminalized. We've sinned. We've all sinned. It comes short of the glory of God, the Bible declares. So in that, we had, to have, we had to have some help because we couldn't break out of jail. We couldn't get out of the prison. It's so wonderful to be out from underneath the penalty of sin. I'm looking forward to the moment when I'm out of its presence. But the penalty of sin has been taken care of by Jesus Christ. And I am free in Him. Am I not right? But I'm going to judgment. I'm going to go face Jesus Christ, my Savior, for what I've done in my life. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now just stay with me a little while tonight, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to consider your daily walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what God's Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It, it tells us that we're supposed to purge out, verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump. You and I are being in charge. We've been in char we're charged with cleansing ourselves according to Corinthians 7. When you and I take upon ourselves to cleanse ourselves, he said, Preacher, I'm already saved by the grace of God. I'm glad you are, and I praise the Lord for it. But I want you to realize something. You and I have a daily bath to take. It's a bath in repentance, if you will. What the Holy Ghost of God convicts me of, I must repent of it. We can't say that we're without sin. If we say that we're a liar, according to 1 John. But what we can say is this, God, I, I realize what you said, and I believe that's right, and so I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to take care of this, God. I'm going to get shed of this. Go with me now, please, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 now. Listen to what God Almighty says here. We're talking, about, we're talking about facing God. We're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear, verse 10, before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive in the things done in his body according to that which he had done, whether it be good or bad. Things done in the body, good or bad. He said, preacher, does it make a difference? Yeah, it makes a world of difference because there's a verse that says our body and our spirit belong to God. It makes a difference. It makes a difference how we do. It makes a difference how we act. It makes a difference how we think. He told us in Philippians to think on these things. 
And so much of the culture today has our minds thinking of so many things. Your old nature itself pollutes your mind. Your mind and my mind in the old, in the old way, my dear family, listen to me. He brings up, that old nature brings up yesterdays. It brings up things that we don't need to think about no more. He even brings up stuff that was placed under the blood of salvation. Are you listening to me? And then even our old nature brings up stuff that we've done since we've been saved. And then he asks us a simple question. Well, I didn't know saved people did that. Well, he that's without sin can cast the first stone. Is that right? They none of us without sin. Is that right? Come on, stay with me now. Thought, word, or deed, attitude, iniquity, sin, transgression, whatever. He said, preacher, what are you trying to tell me? Uh, when was the last time you sat down with the grace of God and rejoiced in the grace of God because of all the sin that God saw and sees that you and I do not? For by grace you are saved through faith, right? Do you know how much sin God's grace takes care of that hasn't even been revealed to me and you yet? That's why He wants you to read the Bible so. Because when you read that Bible, you'll find out, man, I didn't, oh goodness, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that. You read Proverbs, you read the, the Psalm, you'll find stuff in there, say, oh goodness, I didn't realize. And you get rid of it. But because you're saved by the grace of God, that grace is already taken care of it eternally. But now God wants you to take care of it temporarily. God wants you to take care of the external now because He is taking care of the internal then. Do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember when you was born again by the grace of God? Do you remember when you gave up the old life and got into the new life? Amen. And, 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 and you remember the first years of your salvation, how rotten and vile and ungodly and dirty you were? Yet how very clean you were? The first years of our salvation, 77, 78, 79, every time the preacher preached, I hit the altar. I finally went to him. I said, listen, I must not be saved yet. because I'm, Man, everything you say I'm guilty of, I'm just dirty, nasty, wicked, vile. He said, no, son, the lights just come on. You finally seen yourself like you really are. <laughs> I said, what? He said, yeah, he said, you are a dirty, rotten devil, but God saved you. He'll work on you. Just stay with it, boy. Don't quit now. It's been 46 years ago. Hallelujah. So put your way to and Sammy. I'm trying to tell you we're all going to stand before that judgment seat. Look at verse 17 of that same text. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, and old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You should put your way to and tell me. I'm trying to tell you, dear family, there's a lot of stuff in our lives that need to become new. Many times, a lot of times, young converts especially, carry a lot of old baggage over with them into the new life. And it literally destroys them in just a few years. If someone in wisdom doesn't take them under wing and try to help them. It's called discipleship. You know, without discipleship, a new convert won't last a year. Do you understand that? A new convert won't make it in here more than a year or two without discipleship. There has to be a foundation for him to stand on day in and day out. One of the foundations is this, my dear family, that you're going to face Jesus Christ at a judgment seat now that you're saved, and you need to understand you're going to give an account of your life, things done to body, good or bad. You're supposed to be a new creature, and this is what new creatures do. This is what new creatures say. This is what new creatures do. See, most of our salvation stories anymore, dear family, leave God out. You hear me? It leaves God out. Ain't you a sinner? Sure am. You want to go to hell? Sure don't. What about offending God? What about Calvary itself? We blow by Calvary like it's just some little minor stuff. That was a massive thing that Jesus Christ did for you and me. And it's a massive thing that He does for you and I day by day. He keeps us by the power of God day by day. Do you realize you're still here because His power has kept you alive? You should have been dead a week ago. You should have been dead a month ago. You women should have never lived through childbirth. But God, He don't quit working just because He gets you saved. Well, okay, He's wrote down in heaven now, 
survive till you come home, boy. He don't say that. He works with us every day. Deals with us. He disciples us every day. He put the discipler in us. He gave us a book of discipleship. He said, now what I want you to do is I want you to learn of me. I'm meek and lowly. Learn of me. My yoke ain't heavy. You take my yoke on you, you'll be all right. But so many times we don't do that. And we wonder, where'd that new convert go? Where'd that new convert go? Where'd that new convert go? He slipped through the cracks. He fell through the holes. Why? Because he was not reminded often enough of his position in Christ Jesus. He was not reminded enough how much God really did for him on Calvary. He was not reminded, my dear family, you know, judgment is sure, is it not? That new convert is not reminded of who the judge really is. Look at John chapter 5, verse 19 and following. Listen to the word of God, please. John verse, chapter 5, verse 19 and following. God says these words to you and I. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. And for the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. See that? 522? Christ is the judge. The young convert doesn't realize that he's not just Savior. He's judge. Now when we go to face the judge at the judgment seat of Christ, that is also our Savior sitting there, thank God. At the white throne judgment, a thousand some years later, they're only going to face the judge because he's not their savior even though he's the savior of all men isn't that the wildest thing you ever heard about he's the savior of all men he's not willing that any should perish and yet man looks at God like you know he he can't be my savior but he is the savior he's the only savior there ain't nobody else I told that crowd down in Louisiana I said listen why will you die for your sins when he paid for them 2,000 years ago when he set you free 2,000 years ago, why would you shun that and refuse the gift of eternal life? And that young married couple over there started to cry. And I kept talking, kept talking about salvation, how wonderful it is, and, and how we're going to face God, and how, how God's going to do with us when we get there. And, and a young teenage girl over here, she started ducking her head and bowing her head, looking down at the floor. When I got done, Brother Tony, I said, listen to me, I don't want you to come up here. We was having dinner on the grounds that day. I said, what I want you to do is this. When everybody else goes to dinner, I want you to come up here. If you're interested in your soul, if you're serious about your soul, if you're concerned about your eternal life, I want you to come up here and talk to me. And here come that crying woman. Mother, wife, she come up and sit down. I sit down beside her. She said, preacher, I ain't saved. I've been in church a long time, but I ain't saved. I said, how do you know you ain't? She said, there ain't nobody in here but me. When light moves in, you know it. When somebody like the Holy Ghost of God moves inside of you, you know it. She said, ain't nobody in there. I said, well, let's talk about it. I opened up my Bible. About that time, I watched it. I looked up, and that young couple was walking up. She was first. He'd take a step up, Brother Tony. Then he'd stop. Then he'd take another step up. Then he'd stop. I said, son, just come on. They ain't no said standing back here wanting this. Just come up here and get some of it. And then here come that teenager. I'm trying to get you to understand something, gang. At the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, you're there because you got born again by the grace of God. You're there because God Almighty saved you from sin and the wrath to come. And God has put your name down to Lamb's Book of Life. Are you listening to me? We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of ourselves. And Christ is that judge. Now, if the judgment begins at the house of God, then should we say, Lord Jesus, all right, start your judgment? Or should we say, Lord, let me judge myself? 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whatsoever you do, do all the glory of God. 
But Corinthians 11.31 says this. Watch your Bible here. 11.31 says these words to you and I. 1 Corinthians 11.31 says, If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So in 1031, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1131 says if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Christ is my judge. I have an opportunity now to judge myself. I do not have to wait for the judgment seat of Christ. Judgment begins at the house of God. I happen to be a walking, breathing house of God. This is the building of God, right? But you're the church. And we have an opportunity right now in 2024 to judge ourselves before God Almighty has to do it, gain some rewards to take home, to lay down at His feet, not to keep, not to brag to the neighbor, you know, over here, over on Glory Road somewhere, or over on Hallelujah Boulevard, how much we did compared to them. No, no, no. Everybody laying them rewards down at the Savior's feet. We step back from Jesus Christ in our white robes of righteousness, and God Almighty looks out at His bride and a smile. Like you looked at your bride when she came down that aisle in that white dress, she's going to be smiling at us. I'm telling you, gang, this judgment seat is something. We need to get ready. I need, I need to know what i got to do to get ready. That's, I'm glad you asked. I'm finally going to get to it. You ready? Here it comes. I'm going to give you a way to get ready for this judgment. Start right now tonight. Judge yourself so you don't have to be judged up there. Number one. Ready? Start receiving the conviction that the Holy Ghost gives you. Quit shunning it. Quit neglecting it. Quit saying, well, it's for him or her or them. It's for the ones in the back or it's for the ones on the side. Quit, re quit, re quit rejecting the convicting power of the Holy Ghost of God. He knows what he's doing. When he tells me you're not right, boy, he knows what he's doing. Well, how can I receive conviction, preacher? How, how, how can I understand what's going on? Well, if you know the Holy Ghost of God, you'll, you'll receive conviction from the reading of the word of the Lord. Now, Hosea says our people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Can I say this to you because I love you? Whichever. Uh, <clears throat> I'm finding all across America people who have no clue what the Bible says or means in the Baptist church. I had them down in Florida just a couple, three weeks ago, or however long it was, I was in Florida. A woman came up to me with the simplest question that you ever heard of in your whole life. I mean, a second grader would have known the answer. This was her question. Brother Don, how can I learn more of the Bible? That's what I thought, Brother Joe. I thought, really? Well, I'm going to give it to you plain. Here's the answer. Read the Word of God every day. She said, man, that sounds like a good idea. I, 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 this kid's been in church for years. I've been preaching to her for a couple, three years now down there. See, the, just the basics are gone in, in today's society for some, some reason or another. She said, well, I want to know what to read. And the Holy Ghost said, she ain't got it. I said, read the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Fourth book, John. It's 21 chapters. When you get done reading it, read it again. And when you get done reading it a second time, read it the third time. And every day, what day is this? And she told me what day it was. I said, read that proverb every day and the book of John. And next year when I come back, you'll have more knowledge of the Word of God. She just hugged my neck and thanked me. You said, preacher, that's elementary. That's the problem. Our elementary school children are flunking. And God helped them at the judgment seat of Christ. Well, I didn't know that. And I didn't know that. And I didn't know that. Well, it's hard to know anything you don't read about. 
You can receive conviction from just reading the Bible. If you say, Holy Ghost, what are you saying? Holy Ghost, are you trying to tell, you trying to tell little Kira? Holy Ghost says, no, I ain't talking to little Kira. It ain't little Kira's reading, it's you reading the Bible. I'm talking to you, son. I'm talking to you, daughter. Every one of us can receive conviction from the reading of the Word of God. Secondly, you can get it from preaching. Now, we're living in a strange day. You can ask your pastor about it. The other men of God to preach here. You can ask them about it, gang. I'm telling you what, preaching is getting tougher by the day because today's people won't receive conviction. They just move to another church. God help you if you say anything that upsets their little apple cart. God have mercy on you if you dare rub them the wrong way in their emotion. How dare you say that to me? Well, I did say it to you. From the Bible. Amen. You're arguing with the Word of God. No, I'm arguing with you, preacher. I'm arguing with you, brother. I'm arguing with you, sister. No, you're not arguing with me at all. All I did was tell you what the Bible said. So, preacher, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you, my dear family, the culture has destroyed us. We are a bunch of emotional wrecks. And if we don't get felt good, why well, we don't feel good, and if we don't feel good, we ain't coming back here no more. They don't love us no more. What a bunch of babies. You can get conviction from preaching. You can get conviction from memory. I'll give you a simple verse to memorize. Ready? Jesus wept. Ain't that something? So, preacher, that don't mean squat. You ponder that verse a while. You'll ponder that verse. You'll find the majesty of that verse is Jesus. Amen. You ponder that verse a while. You'll find that the most compassionate person in the world is weeping. He looks at you and weeps. He looks at me and weeps. It ain't but two words, but I'm telling you right now, that two-word message in that thing, my family, gives you some kind of something or other that'll stand on you and stand with you through the thick and the thin and realizing that God really does care about me. Amen. You can get that from memory. You can get conviction, my dear family, from examples. I'm going to say a real dumb statement. You ready for a real dumb statement? Does any of you saints know any Christians? Don't sit there and get stewed up on me. Does any of you saints know any Christians? You can be convicted by example. A brother or sister in the Lord lives for God. And you're a little lascivious in your living. And they come by and you feel antsy. And you don't want to be around them. And you don't want to, you don't want to enter conversation with them. And, and you pray they don't ask you any Bible questions. <laughs> so preacher, what are you trying to say? I'm just trying to say, dear family, all saints are not necessarily Christian. Christianity is a Christ-like deal. There are moments in our lives, family, come, stay with me now, listen to my words. There are moments in our lives that we're not very Christian. And if somebody comes by at that very moment, they may not really think that we're with it. Do you do realize that all of us are being conformed to the image of Christ? Is that right? You do realize that some of us are sore. Come on, love. Did you ever knock a hunk out of yourself? Did you ever have a wrench slip and take the top side of your knuckle off? That's what Christ is trying to do with us. Knock everything off of us that don't look like Him. And sometimes we get sore. Sometimes He's taken some chunks out of us. Sometimes a wrench has slipped and we've knocked the top of our knuckle off. And somebody comes by and we're not exactly as Christian as we're supposed to be. Conviction. If you receive conviction, it'll help you get ready for the judgment seat of Christ. Number two, if you confess that God is right, 
Quit trying to justify ourselves. Quit trying to trick him into believing the way we believe. Quit trying to get him to understand this is 2024, God. It ain't, you know, 06. It ain't, you know, 34 AD. God in heaven, this is 2024. Things are different now. Things are, things are uh, stranger now. Things are this now, God. And, and you just got to understand, God. And God sits on his throne. He says, I do understand completely. But I told you, you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. And, and I told you that you're supposed to walk this way. And I, and I told you I'd be with you all the way, all the end of the world. I told you that I would just stay with you all the way. You didn't have to go. I told you you wouldn't be alone. I told you I'd take care of it. Well, yeah, but God, you didn't. And God says, yes, but I did. I just didn't do it your way. I did it my way, for my glory, for my praise, for my honor. Church, do we believe? Do we believe what God's Bible says? Now, again, here's, here's another real dumb question, okay? Do we honestly believe for all of sin and come short of the glory of God? You know, in order to get ready for the judgment seat of Christ, we have to believe that. And we've got to believe that God is right. Yeah, but... Brother Doc, Grandma was so sweet and so kind, and she made the best cookies. She's got to be in heaven, preacher. Cookies and kindness and sweet grandmas don't make them saved. Until she comes to Christ Jesus, she's still lost just like the finest young person. Come on, stay with me now. We let emotion dictate who's saved and who ain't saved. God Almighty said all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Do we believe that? Do we believe this one? Do we believe that, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord? Do we believe that? No, we just fly through that in the Romans Road pre presentation of the gospel. But do we really believe the wages of sin is death? Or is what they're doing not so bad? I mean, it ain't as bad as what they're doing. Then it's showing as bad as what they're doing. But God Almighty says the wages of sin is death. And in order for us to get ready for the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to have to believe about sin the way God does. It's rotten, violent, put my son on the cross, God says. It is what was going to condemn you to eternal hell, God says. You could not pay your sin debt. You could not satisfy my righteous judgment. You couldn't take care of this thing. So I sent my son down to please me. I sent my son down to take care of my judgment on sin. Do you believe that? And in order for us to get right with God before the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to have to believe that. That the wages of my sin was death. And because God didn't want me to die, He let His son die in my place. Tonight I'm free. Do we believe that, church? Or is it just a verse we blow through trying to tell people about Christ? Mankind today don't even, listen, driving by, driving by, driving by, out there, and what's that road, Eaglewood? What's that road? Sunday evening. I mean, there's thousands of cars going by while I'm looking out the windows. You know what's wrong with them people? They don't believe it's sin. They don't believe certain things are sinful. They don't believe certain things are going to be judged by God Almighty, but they're going to find out, sure as you're living, that there's going to be a judgment against sin. And if they don't come to Christ, they're not going to be able to withstand the judgment of God Almighty because they can never pay their sin debt by this self. Neither could we. But we believed God, didn't we? And when we believed God, we said, God in heaven, we can't do this. God in heaven, would you forgive me my sin and save my soul, please? And he did. And when you got saved by the grace of God, God Almighty took your sin debt away. Your penalty is gone. You're pardoned from your crime. You and I are free because the truth made us that way. But yet we forget this judgment. We take for granted we'll be okay at the judgment just because we're saved. I'm telling you, saved ain't enough. It's enough to get you to that judgment. It's enough to get you to heaven, but it ain't enough to get through that judgment. God Almighty wants us as right as we could possibly be. 
2 Corinthians 5, 10 said we're all going to have judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says we're new creatures in Christ. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at about verse 18. For as much as you know, you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, your wicked old life, your empty, no good old life. You're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation re received by tradition from your fathers. You, listen, you weren't saved just because your daddy was. You and you wicked thing. You 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 understand something. But with the precious blood of Christ, you are born again. Amen. See, the blood of Jesus Christ is what takes care of sin. His name takes care of spirits. You follow that Bible close, you find that the blood deals with the sin and His name deals with the spirits. A lot of folks, I plead the blood of Jesus on this evil spirit. Well, that's fine and dandy, but that spirit ain't going to get saved. But in the name of Jesus, I command thee, come out of her. And in the name of Jesus, that spirit leaves. Come on. You say, preacher, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you, my dear family, at the judgment seat of Christ, we can confess that God is right. God in heaven, you know what I want you to do? What do you want me to do? I want you to save me, and I want you to show me how to live. God's Bible says in verse 21, who by him do believe in God. Is that you and me? Is that you and me? Oh, you dear people are so weak. Who by him do believe in God. Let's try that again. Is that you and me? Amen. Hey, now you're alive. Amen. That raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. See, you purified your souls in obeying the truth unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again. There it is again. Being born again, not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. All flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass with it, the flower of faith away, falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. This is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. I need to get ready for the judgment seat, brother Don. What do I do? Receive conviction. Secondly, believe that God is right. Did not Romans teach us, let God be true and every man a liar? Every man a liar, every man. I hate to say this, but every man a liar. When it comes to certain things, every man's a liar. God's never lie. Titus declared God never lies. We serve a God who never lies. He's promised us eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Ain't that right? We must believe God. Why? Because there are times in our daily walk do we believe him for salvation? We believe him about the blood. We believe him about the book. We believe him about the, the way that he says we can only go to heaven through Jesus Christ. But we sometimes fail to believe him about our daily walk through this life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added unto you. But I, I, I know, but did God tell you that? Preacher, I want you to pray for me. What for? Well, I'm, I'm going to go to college. Well, good. What college did God tell you to go to? What? I said, what college did God tell you to go to, son? He said, well, I, uh, I just would like to go to, and you name any college you want. i just like to go to, to, to that college. I said, well, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord. Is that the one God told you to go to? Well, uh, no. I said, then you best not go till he tells you. Uh, Brother Don, uh, uh, me and her's engaged. Wonderful. That's a great blessing. Praise the Lord. When is God going to tell you to get married? Well, uh, 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 we're getting married in June. Is that what God said? Well, no, that's what she said. See, on our daily walk, we neglect God. We love Him for salvation. We love Him for what He's doing in our lives in salvation and eternity. But we miss, we miss God so much in our temporary. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? I'm just trying to get you to understand something. We're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. Maybe even tonight before dark, we're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. 
I'm asking me now. I'm leaving you alone already. Am I ready to face my maker and give an account of my life, thought, word, and deed, body, soul, and spirit, to my Jesus, who loved me, gave himself for me, am I ready to face that judgment seat of Christ and gain reward or lose reward? God in heaven, that Corinthians text, told me that there's gold and silver and precious stone. God in heaven is my life, wood, hay, and stubble. God is all I'm going to be able to give you is ashes. God, what, what, is, what is my life? God, what is, what is it that I'm doing? What, what is it? You say, you say I'm supposed to do everything I do for the glory of God. Okay, God, does this bring you glory? Does this honor you, Father? Does this bring praise to you? Does this exemplify you? Does this, does this show you to a lost and dying world all around me? God, am I an example of a believer? God in heaven, where I go, does anybody want to be like me? Paul said they glorified God in him. Does anybody want to glorify God because I'm around them? I'm asking God. You see, preacher, what are you trying to say? I'm just trying to get you to understand something, gang. I don't know all we're going to face in this judgment seat of Christ, but I know this. We can get ready for it if we receive some conviction about some things that God might deal with us about. And secondly, we, we can be ready for it, my dear family, if we realize that we've got to just believe God. Yeah. Now go to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to wrap this thing up. Hug your neck. Shake your hand. Me and Mama's going back to Williamsburg, head, to, head to over to Fisherville tomorrow. Please pray for us as we try to help the preacher for a couple of weeks. Pray for him. He's got heart trouble, calcifying veins. Nobody to take the work. Half the church is sick with flu. And he is having a pickle of a time over there. We're going to try to help him for a couple of weeks. And then we hit the road the 1st of May. And from the 1st of May to November, we're, on, we're in revival meetings. Here, there, and wherever. I want you to realize something, gang. Every one of us need, every one of us, at least in prayer, day in and day out. You've got that. Do you understand that? You've got to have each other. You've got to stay with each other. You cannot quit now. You cannot give it up now. You can't fold up now and throw in the towel now. You have a preacher, I'm mad. Scratch your mad spate, get glad again. As her granny used to say, I'm mad, granny. She said, good. Scratch that mad place and get glad again. You ain't old enough to get mad. You ain't got real reason to be mad. Well, Chucky did this and Chucky did that. Yeah? Is that in retaliation for what you did to him or what? And granny would burn us up and tear us up. Listen, gang, there, you're gonna, offenses will come. Somebody's going to aggravate you. Somebody's going to pet you the wrong way. Just turn around, cat. Just turn around. You don't like tail to head petting? Turn around. Let them pet you from head to tail. You can't quit now, church. What I'm trying to tell you. This is my third point. You ready? Here it comes. 1 Corinthians 15. God Almighty says, and thanks be unto God, verse 57, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's pieces of life that ain't easy. There's pieces of life that show up unexpectedly. There's pieces of life that you see coming and there ain't one thing you can do to stop it. But this old hillbilly that loves you is looking you right in the face and saying this. You ready? I'm telling you because you're young and full of life. Don't you ever quit. No matter what anybody else around you does, no matter what happens around your life, you just stay with God. Stay in that book. Stay with everybody that's with God. And you hang on. Because your Jesus is on his way back to get you. Yes! And you don't want to face him a quitter. You got four of the finest looking babies I've ever seen in a long time. Don't you dare stop now raising them babies for Christ. It don't matter if they don't understand. It don't matter if he's asleep. You keep them in the house of God. 
until their little heads start to soak up that which Brother Tony preaches. Just stay on that front row. Good place for you to be. We need you right there on guard duty. If the book of man comes through that door, it's your deal. You got him. You don't stop what God started. What he had begun, he will finish. You got to make up your mind. God, what you started, I'm going to finish. I'm going all the way to the rapture, God. I'm going all the way to the end of this trail, God. I'm not stopping halfway. I'm not quitting halfway and building me a house. I'm not stopping halfway and putting me up a tent. I'm going all the way to the end of the trail, Lord. No matter what comes, whether I enjoy it or not, I ain't stopping. I ain't quitting. I ain't giving up. Boy, girl, God has put a blessing on you with them fingers. That piano playing is phenomenal. Don't you ever stop. You play when nobody else wants to hear it. Because God has started a work in you at salvation that he wants to bring to conclusion at the judgment seat of Christ. That's where it ends. Not at the rapture. Not at death. At the judgment seat of Christ. You keep singing, brother, leading them songs. This church sounded like it had hundreds in here tonight. Don't stop. Don't quit. The next breath, you could inhale here and exhale at the judgment seat of Christ. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Mama, get your song, please. I don't have to ask if there needs to be some adjustments in your life. I don't have to ask that because there ain't nobody here that don't need to adjust something. All I'm asking you to do is this. Just do what the Holy Ghost tells you to do right now. If you're here lost tonight, you best hurry up and get saved. If you're here saved tonight and things look a little bleak or bleary or things are full of glory and bright lights. Either way, your next breath could be at the judgment seat of Christ. Preacher, I just need some prayer tonight. I just need some prayer tonight. Would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you. God bless you and you and you. Amen. You, I see you, dear. I see you. Who else? Preacher, I need some prayer. God bless you, brother. I see that. God bless all. Thank God for you. Thank God for you honest Baptist folk. Judgment begins at the house of God. But if we would judge ourselves, we shall not be judged. So what I want you to do is this. I want you to be the judge before you face the judge. Father, bless these dear people that have raised their hand. Bless these that didn't. That, Father, all of us would search our lives, examine ourselves, and show ourselves, God, and judge ourselves. And what's wrong, Father, chastise us for it, correct us in it, help us get rid of it. But what's good in us, Heavenly Father, let us expand it. Let us grow it to your glory, to your honor, to your praise. God, bless Brother Tony and little Kira, God, this great church. Help these dear people over here, God, on this coast. And, Father, may more souls be saved, more saints be helped. And, Father, when we come home to the rapture, God, in the rapture, may we all gain reward and not lose. In Jesus' name, sing, Mama. You just mind the Lord now. What did he tell you to do? Just before the judgment seat of Christ, what does God want you to do?
judgment begins at the house of God. Best for Jesus. Judge yourself. When he First. has done so much for me. Is this right or is this wrong? Hours that I've wasted are so many. God, help me adjust this. Help me get rid of this. Help me expand on this. God, I want to bring my Christian life home to the judgment seat, gaining, not losing. I wonder if his heart is breaking too. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? When he has done so much for me, I wonder, have I cared enough for others? Or have I let them die alone? I might have helped a wonder to the Savior, the seed of precious life I might have sown. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chain I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? When he has done so much for me, no longer will I stay within the valley. I'll climb to mountain heights above. The world is dying now for want of someone to tell them of the Savior's matchless love. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chain I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? When he has done so much for me,